I'm going to begin with a cliche because like all cliches, they're hundred percent true, right? Here's one we could all agree on, right? We're going to start this talk with something we all agree on and we're going to end with my conclusion that probably none of you will agree with. And I think that's a good way to go because if it was a happy ending, it would be boring. Who would care? So I think we start out all agreeing and we work towards controversy. And I leave you upset at the end of the day. So, well, just a little, you know, don't, don't get all upset yet. So here's the cliche. You can choose your friends, but you cannot choose your family. But it's true, right? So I was thinking about that as I was thinking about putting together this talk. And suppose you could, suppose you could choose your family. Some of you would say, well, I would choose a fun family, first of all. And then you might get this, and then you'd be in there, which would probably be good for a little while. I don't know how well it would play. Or you could say, I want to have a more exotic family, fun but exotic. I might like that family. I think it would be interesting for a while. So what if you had a family and you said, well, look, I, you know, fun is one thing, exotic's one thing, but I, I just want a rich family. I just, you know, I just want money to be no problem. Okay, suppose you say, suppose you say, look, I just, I, I like money. I want to be rich, but I also want to be powerful. And I want everybody to leave me alone, rich and powerful, and just get out of my way, leave me alone. And there's your family. How would this work? There might be some problems that got worked out for you, which would be nice. Your life would be very different though, right? Depending on who your family was. And so that's where I want to start. You don't choose that, right? And there's a whole bunch of stuff you don't choose. I'm going to try and get slides ahead of time. Do you even choose to be born? Good question. Does anybody think they did? Do you choose the body you have? I would have been taller. I would have been a lot of things. There are a lot of things you don't choose. And that's where we're going to start with Vincent. This is mom. And she's a completely uh, loving mother. This is a painting he did of her. And by the way, for those of you that are painters, you might want to know that he painted this from a photograph. When he first started out, he did that. A lot of painters get really concerned about that issue in their lives. And here's his father. Now, I know. Wow. His father is a minister. And his father is a very, he's not sort of, he's a very straight, strict guy. And it's not that we wouldn't choose a minister, but it just happens to be the fact that it was a minister, right? That it was his dad. Now, if you have a dad for a minister, are they going to have certain expectations? Oh, yeah. Are you going to be able to say no as a kid? Probably not. Okay, and this is his brother, Theo. And you can't choose your siblings either, but he kind of lucked out with Theo. So Vincent is the older brother. Anybody here is, who's a, a man, not, I'm, I'm leaving women out, okay? And you can shoot me. If you're a man and you have a brother, you're competitive as boys, and sometimes even into manhood. Now, usually one brother sort of becomes ascendant, and the other brother gets what? Sort of resentful, you know? Sort of upset. Vincent is going to be the brother who just can never do anything right. And it's kind of maddening for his parents. And you would think his little brother would be like, neener, neener, I'm better than you. I was a brother. I had a little one. I had one smaller and one bigger. So, you know, I neenered both of them. It was a double neener. But his younger brother loves him. And no matter what Vincent does, he finds a way to think that it's okay. And for Vincent, this just makes it worse. Whenever he fails, instead of his brother being triumphant, his brother says, well, look, I'll help you. So this is going to be a backdrop to Vincent's life. And let's just go ahead to the next. So here's the thing about the choice. And I want to make a point. So Vincent is born. Father is a, is a Protestant minister. Got a lovely mother. Got a brother. Got younger sisters. Now, what if he were born 100,000 years ago? slide is already up, so the surprise isn't there. But the point of the matter is he would have been a caveman, right? 
And so the point I want to make is that Vincent is going to not only be a troubled young man, he's going to largely be a product of the culture that he finds himself in, right? Which is 19th century. It's Dutch. That's the language he's going to speak. There's the schools he's going to go to. Let's go to the next one. Ah, I kind of like this. Hand me, you know. Don't do anything. So this is Vincent's uncle. It's going to confuse you. Try not to be too confused. His name is... Vincent. So he's Vincent Van Gogh, but it's Vincent's uncle. And Vincent Van Gogh, the uncle, is a prominent art dealer. So, you know, he's, he's in a suit because he's got money, and the, and the name of his um, company that he works for is Goop Heels. So those of you that have studied 19th century art, you know Goop Heels is the biggest art dealer in 19th century Europe. And the family comes to him and said, Uncle Sant, because they called him Sant, I love it, Uncle Sant. Vincent is a troubled, he's a troubled guy. You know, he doesn't seem to connect with people. He has trouble talking with people. He gets angry. He's whatever the 19th century equivalent of wrapped tight. He's wrapped kind of tight. Could you give him a job? Now, in the 19th century, in the 20th century, and well into the 21st century, when somebody's got issues, it's not always a solution to give them a job. I'm just... Throwing that out there. So, <laughs> because they go to the job, they take their problems where? Uh, with them. So, Vincent begins, let's have the next slide. So, he goes to work. This is Goop Heels in the 19th century. Big, big building. There are, there are Goop Heels in Amsterdam, Paris, and London, right? This is international. He goes there and people come in and they say, look, we want to buy some art. And Vincent would say, why? You think you know something about art? Well, maybe a little, well, listen, you just listen to me, and I'll tell you what art is. Sometimes the way to sell things to people is to be nice. That's just a thought. That's customer training, a customer service. Vincent doesn't get this in a big way. And so what do you do once you've given a nephew a job? Um, any ideas? Here's a standard answer. Transfer them. You just move him to another branch. So you take Vincent and you send him to Paris. And people would just walk in the, the door and say, bonjour. And he'd say, what? Not good. So what do you do after the second time? Remember I told you there are three stores. You transfer him again. So they transfer him a third time to London. And this time, you know, it, it's just not going to work. The track record is too bad, so they put him in the back just stacking things and opening boxes and stacking things. And Vincent falls in love with prints. He can't buy paintings, but he sees prints. He sees all these black and white images of work by everybody, everybody that's working. And sometimes these artists pop in because they talk to the dealer that they're working with. So there are artists like Georges Michel that you've never heard of, I bet, that Vincent absolutely falls in love with. These images by Michelle are moody and romantic and the clouds are swirling. And do you think Vincent will later do swirling cloud images? Absolutely. And he sees these things firsthand. You know, the surfaces, the texture, the strokes. And again, sometimes he gets to meet the artist himself. Ah, one of them, one of the most successful artists that's selling at Goop Heels is, you're not going to believe this, is his own cousin. His cousin is Anton Mauve. Anton Mauve features largely in the show. You've seen him. And so the family goes to Anton and says, you know, at some point, maybe you're going to want to give Vincent some lessons because Vincent shows some interest in drawing and painting. How do you think that goes? Any guesses? How long do you think it lasts? Who would say a year? A month? Yeah, less. Three weeks. Okay, but... Important to know that right there in his family, not only does he have art dealers in his family, right? He has artists in his family. So he didn't choose this, but he grows up with it and he knows it. He knows that an art career is possible. It's something that you could possibly do. And here's another slide of another artist that he sees on a regular basis, Ari Schaefer. And Ari Schaefer is gonna do a print that becomes Van Gogh's all-time favorite print, but I thought I'd show you this instead. 
absolutely elegant piece that he will copy later. Van Gogh is going to be somebody who remembers everything he sees. This is an image of a mine in Belgium. It's called an area called the Borinage. What happens with Vincent in London, as we know, is he goes to the back room, he's stalking things, but he's vociferous, you know, and he's just caustic all the time. So finally, he just has to go. And when he goes, you know, he's jobless. For a while, he works as a bookseller. He's at loose ends. He's disappointing to his father, certainly, and other people as well. And if you're gonna, and this is a short story, if you're going to try and make up for being so disappointing for so long, how do you think you might try and please your dad? Some men try this. Follow in his footsteps. Not always a good idea. You might want to think that one through. Vincent decides to become a preacher. So he actually is going to take Bible courses and theology courses, and he's going to do this formally and become a minister. And so early on, he goes to the mines known as the Borinage in Belgium, just over the French border, and he's going to preach, preach to the miners while he's working on theology, his theological studies. And Vincent, being who he is, thinks, I'm going to be Christ-like. I'm going to deny my body. I'm not going to have drink. I'm not going to have, I'm not going to have food. I'm never going to bathe. And I think, you know, I've read the Bible. I don't think Jesus went that far. I think he kept up. He looked okay most of the time. Vincent did not. You know, I mean, literally, doesn't bathe, doesn't eat. You know, he gets skinny, he gets wild-eyed. So here are these miners, these very tough guys, and they spend all day long, 12, 14 hours, you know, working a mine. And then after they come up from the mine, here's this guy with his bright red hair. He looks like a dirty carrot, right? And he's got this Bible in his hand, and he's yelling at him. He doesn't go over. So he's going to get asked to go from the Borinage. Like, well, you know, you need to just leave. And... Um, it just doesn't seem to stick. Nothing seems to stick. All right. So if you, if you fail as an art dealer, and you fail as a minister, and you've got artists in your family, what do you think you might think about becoming? When all else fails, be an artist. Right? That holds true today. The thing about the Borinage is Vincent was always seeing people struggling. Not enough to eat, working too hard, getting sick, not having the help they need. And we shouldn't doubt that he was genuinely religious. I mean, he believed. And he prayed. And he thought that, you know, what a painter could be is like a preacher, only reveal the truth of Scripture in images rather than in words. That, you know, Jesus didn't come to save rich people. He came to save the poor and the meek. It's the meek that are going to inherit the earth. And art could reveal the dignity of the meek and the poor. And this is a drawing he does early on, 1882, influenced by his time with the miners, a man with a spade. And in our show, and you see this man looking down, bent over, tired. Early on in his career, this theme of the single worker is going to you know, fill his mind and stay with him and be a be central to understanding who he is. So let's have, a, let's have the next one. A couple of years after that, Vincent is now going to be working all the time, painting, mid-80s. And, and here's where we need to stop and, and talk about how that works. And then we'll talk a little bit about the painting. So you've been fired from all your jobs, and you decide to become an artist, and you're going to paint all the time. And so you're going to need canvas, you're going to need brushes, you're going to need paints. And plus, he's got a couple of habits, right? Anybody know what his habits are? He likes to drink. Thank you. But what goes really good with a drink? Smoke. So you got to, he smokes, smokes all the time, drinks a lot. Do you have to buy those things? Yeah. So you got canvas, oil paints, brushes, you need tobacco, you need liquor, and then a couple of other things on the side that cost money. How are you going to live if you don't have a job? Nobody rides free. Somebody's going to support you. And guess who that's going to be? It's going to be his little brother. He's going to support him every month, pretty much for the rest of his life. He starts sending him 150 francs a month. And the average teacher at the same time, any teachers here, you should feel bad because the average teacher was making 75 francs a month. 
right? And Vincent's getting 150. So he's gonna be supported and this is gonna enable him to paint all the time. This is an image in our show and it's of a weaver. This comes to us from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and it's a really well-known piece of his because it's early on and really you would think this early in his career it might be all gray and rather dark like a lot of his work it was and it is somewhat dark but you look at what he's weaving and it's this bright red fabric and when you get into the show and you look close up at the face of this weaver the lips are bright red has anybody just peeked up close at the painting they're bright red so early on in his career Vincent is sort of got his own take on things. And what I really want you to look at closely in this, and you, it's hard to see, I know, in the, in the image on the wall, but his right arm goes straight down, and then his left arm comes straight up. I mean, excuse me, his, his right hand goes straight up. And from his right hand, just draw a line down to where his elbow would be, and then you realize that his upper right arm would have to be about four or five feet long, you know? He can't really draw yet. If ever, he goes to an academy to try and learn academic figure drawing, and artists just mock him, you know, and he gets angry and he throws his easel on the floor and kicks it and screams and cusses. Yeah, I'm not going to do this. I don't have to put up with this. It's not something he's ever going to master, and that's okay. He goes home and he gets drawing books, color theory books, and he reads them on his own. I don't need you. I'll do it myself. He becomes extremely hermetic in that sense. And this is a good example of this. By this time, he might have known how long an upper arm was, but it didn't matter, and it didn't stop him. Things don't tend to stop him. And this is where I want to point out that everything Vincent does, he does with an extraordinary amount of passion. Now, people look back at his life and say, well, you know, that's because he was mad. I don't even know what mad means anymore. I think it's a word we ought to probably dispense with. I think people say, well, he was bipolar. Well, he could have been, but we don't really know. I mean, he was never diagnosed. And even today, you could diagnose somebody and be wrong. He might have just been acutely depressed. That seems very possible. He might have been manic. He might have been all of those things. He might have been none of those things. But we know he was wrapped really tight about everything. So he tries to draw, fails, but keeps doing it. As a reader, he reads everything that's out there. He reads novels, he reads biographies, he reads treaties. This is not a dumb guy. You need to have that in the back of your head. He's very smart, well-read. And what does he do to communicate his thoughts? He writes, thank you so much. He writes letters because his brother's not around. His brother works for Goupils. His brother's a successful art dealer, wears a suit, is very nice, makes a whole lot of money, sends Vincent money. All right. Vincent expresses himself in his letters. And if you haven't read these letters, they're all online, right? In English and easily read and they're revelatory. You know, you can read these feelings that he shares about being passionate about just everything. And sometimes when he likes a book, he reads it three or four times. Books he read as a child, he still carries around with him as an adult, all right? So smoking, also passionate, drinking, passionate, do you think that he wants to be in love in his life? Who doesn't? Yeah, but it's never going to work out. He tries to start a romantic relationship with his cousin. He tries to start a romantic relationship with his cousin. That fails. He's rebuffed. Good to know these things. Now, let me throw in our, where we started. Does he choose that? Nobody chooses heartbreak. But it happens to him quite often. I'm showing you a slide now of a Leon Lermite painting that is also in the show, and you can see how carefully Vincent has looked at precedent. All artists look at precedent. All artists look at what everybody else has done and how they might do it better, right? Or differently, or uniquely. He's no different. He looks at everybody, and he uses the formula that he sees around him. Let's just go to the next one. Ah! Now here's a famous painting, not in our show, just because I didn't want to borrow it. And um, it's called The Potato Eaters. This is influenced by his time working with the miners and it's very dark and everybody looks, it's interesting that it's called The Potato Eaters because their heads sort of remind me of potatoes. They're bumpy and dark and they're oddly and awkwardly drawn. 
and he writes to his brother that I've, I've done this major painting and you've got to see it. And so Theo says, yeah, great, great, I want to see it. And so Theo finally does see it, and what happens? He doesn't like it. And he tells his brother. Sometimes he has his heart broken by his own brother. And he said, but, you know, what I was trying to express was, you know, the struggle and the pain and the, how difficult it is just to live. How difficult it is just to live. And Theo's like, yeah, okay. But maybe art should be soothing and comforting and, you know, all of that stuff. And Vincent's like, yeah, I got that. And um, it, it should and it can be. But his desire to reveal the inner life of people is always there. And the inner life of people he knows is not always pretty. Sometimes it's hugely painful. Yeah. Millet becomes an artist who is of enormous importance to Van Gogh. Millet is somebody that paints sowers in the field, weavers, workers, right? So he looks at Millet constantly and he copies Millet all the time. Right now, the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam is working on a show called Millet and Van Gogh. And it's gonna bring together all the Millets and then the Van Gogh copies. I'd have done that show, I just didn't want to. And um, so not only does he admire Millet, reads his biography, reads it twice, reads it three times, writes to people about why Millet is the father of all of us. This is extraordinary passion. Let's have the next slide. Okay. So eventually, after, after the um, potato eaters especially, which is right around mid-80s, 84, 85 in there, I think 85, Theo says to him, you know what you really need to do is you really got to come to Paris and um, get a change of scenery. And so Vincent does this, and Theo's got a nice apartment in Paris. He's not married yet. And now, so here's Theo and Vincent, and they get together, and they're living in the same apartment. What, what's the problem with this? They're living in the same apartment. That's the problem. I mean, it's not that Theo doesn't love him. He does, but this is his brother, and his brother can be, you know, it's difficult. So Theo actually handles the work of this painter, Claude Monet, and this is a little bit advanced for Goupil. Goupil is usually handling, you know, older stuff, Rembrandt and so forth. But Theo says, look, you know, there's other art out there in the world being made. And give me a chance. I think this guy Monet might be onto something. And so he sells Monet's when he can. So what does this mean for Vincent? Vincent not only gets to see Monet's, he gets to meet a lot of these artists that are working in the Impressionist mode. He meets them directly. He goes to the same cafes that they go to. He talks with them in the cafes. He winds up organizing a show for his own work and some of his artist buddies that he meets in Paris. Vincent is never outside of the art loop. That's something to know. He's always in it. He's got this brother who's a big dealer. He meets artists that are on the cutting edge and he knows what they're doing. He's not this mythic guy that sits in an attic all by himself, right? never seeing anybody, creating masterworks. He knows what's going on, and he sees it firsthand, and he absorbs it. Okay. One of his favorite painters at this time is going to be an artist, again, that you've never heard of, but he and his brother admired greatly. It was an artist named Adolf Monticelli. We have two or three Monticellis in the show, and Monticelli paints with this really thick paint and just you know, scrubs it onto the canvas. and. Um, Vincent just adores it, and he tells his brother Theo that Monticelli's already done everything that I want to do. That's almost a verbatim quote. And they love him, and they organize a show of Monticelli's work. That's how much they adore his work. What Monticelli doesn't really do is incorporate impressionist color, in you know, really bright color. But the thick paint and the verve, you know, the, the thickness of the paint, it's all there. So he's an extraordinary artist. So he's meeting Monet. He's loving Monticelli, right? He's got the prints of just about every artist that has made a print, not just European, American as well, all right? He sees American publications and he gets prints by American artists as well. He knows who they are. There's a John White Alexander in our show who's a famous American painter who illustrated for Harper's Weekly. Vincent collected all of those. What else does he collect? Japanese prints. His interests are international and he copies Japanese prints. So at this time in Paris, he's just crazy, crazy busy. Let's have the next slide. And he paints this. 
Now we're gonna talk about this for just a second. It's clear, and any like, you know, uh, brand new art history professor would stand up and say, well, he's obviously seen the, the Impressionists and he's absorbed the influences and you see it right here in the brushstrokes. But that's true. You see it in these short staccato brushstrokes and you see it in this much brighter palette and it looks a little different than your average Monet though, doesn't it? First of all, Monet doesn't do portraits. I mean, rarely does he do portraits, especially self-portraits. This is his self-portrait and the Impressionists as a rule aren't really into self-portraits. Why might that be? You can't sell them. Who wants a portrait of somebody else? You get a portrait, you get it of your wife or your kids, you get a portrait of yourself, you don't want a portrait of some guy. That's why they don't, there's no market for these, but you know, why would you paint yourself? Free model, it's free. Also, you're always there and you're always painting. So sometimes he has models, sometimes he doesn't, but he's always there and he's willing to look at himself. And when you see him in this image, you tell me if I'm wrong here, does he look a little intense? Just a little bit? Is his, are his eyes just not piercing right at you? I mean, like burning right through you? Now, I. Look at every Monet you want. I'm not picking on Monet, I love Monet. We did a show on Monet here at the museum. Monet doesn't pierce anything. You know, he just, he's really easy on the eyes. He looks at the world and he is the key impressionist, really. He's a brilliant painter, a great eye, wonderful hand, but he looks at a landscape and he replicates it with lightness and a soft touch. It's beautiful, all right? But intense emotion, oh, that's something else. I don't see that along the Seine. What I see is this just beauty ebbing before my eyes. Monet's great at that. And Vincent looks at himself and he sees himself and what he feels. That's different. And most impressionists you look at, they're lovely to look at, they're really pretty, but they almost uniformly from when Renoir to Degas to Monet lack intensity. It just isn't there. It's not part of their stick. And why, why, why does Vincent bring this to his paintings? The idea I've been pushing so far in this talk that you're free to disagree with 100%, it's free, free lecture. See, he doesn't have a choice. He's an intense person. It's who he is. He's wrapped tight. He's not gonna be able to say, oh, I'll just leave, I'll check myself at the door and be somebody else while I paint. That's not possible. Listen, if we could just check our feelings at the door anytime we wanted and be happy all the time, wouldn't you be happy all the time? <laughs> I would. <laughs> oh, I think I'll just be upset now. You don't have a choice. You're gonna get upset. Once in a while, you're gonna be happy. I love it when people start talking about how life is all about choice. Really? Well, we'll just be happy. Well, I will eventually. Not a good answer. He's always wrapped tight and there's nothing he can do about it. And so when you see this portrait, which we did get for the show, this is one intense individual who understands Impressionism, who likes doing self-portraits. Oh, partly because Rembrandt did them all the time. I can't leave that out. He loves Rembrandt. Rembrandt did them all the time. He shows who he is. This is different. And I'm gonna use the word expressionist. Some art historians would disagree with me because I apply it to him a little earlier than, than normally would be applied. I think he's the first truly expressionist painter. Okay, so while he's in Paris, he's dreaming about an artistic colony that could live, he, he could live in the south of France, invite artists to come there, all live together in harmony, and do what? Paint, be brothers, Bring art forward because art has the power, Vincent believed, to reveal goodness, the beauty of nature and why we should all love nature because nature is just all around us and makes us feel better. And it's good to know that we're part of it and that harmony is a possibility. Everything in nature ultimately winds up being harmonious in his mind. And we have that power, he believes. Painters have that power more so than bankers or policemen or anything else to show people the beauty that's just right there, right outside your door. So he talks his brother into this, like rent an apartment for me in the south of France. How many have been there to the yellow house? Yeah, okay, it's still there because it brings in money to the town. So it does. 
So Theo says, okay, we'll do that. And Vincent is gonna, his first artist that he's gonna invite there is Paul Gauguin. And this is a Paul Gauguin of Vincent painting sunflowers. So you have this little apartment, for those of you that have been there, you know it's not big, right? It's small. So here's Vincent and here's Gauguin and they're in the same apartment. How do you think that goes? What's the problem? They're in the same apartment. That's the problem. And Vincent wants things. I mean, he wants Van uh, Gauguin to be excited, you know, about the, about let's change the world. And Gauguin is, God, you know, don't you ever relax? No, don't you ever just like go, let's go have a drink kind of thing? But Vincent has big plans that are even bigger than Gauguin's. And his, his intensity is hard to live with on a on a one-to-one, -one, everyday kind of basis. Can I have the next one, please, too? And this is, Gauguin, this is Gauguin looking at himself. And I love this because there's always, you know, it's so revelatory. These guys didn't, you know, they didn't shy away from showing you, like, who they were. He is very sort of halfway suave and egotistical almost in this image. And his eyes sort of that, that, that droopy bedroom, half-closed um, sensuality to it. And almost, almost, I think, the touch of a smirk. But... I know Gauguin kind of too well. I think that's what he was evoking there. And that's another painter back in the corner, Emil Bernard. And so Gauguin is painting while he's there. But this portrait, compared, say, to the other portrait, two really different personalities. And it's not likely that Gauguin is going to buy into this idea of a brotherhood of artists, and at least not with uh, Vincent running it. And so he's going to leave. They get in a big, big fight, and he goes. And um, he goes, and people always ask, uh, did he really cut off his ear? And um, because, you know, and I think one of the reasons I get that question so often is because they hear it, but they don't, they don't know what to believe anymore because we live in a world where there's so many, cons so many I was going to say conspiracy, conspiracy theories, where there's so many different stories, they don't know what to believe, and I have to tell them, yes, yeah, he really did it. It was in the news. You know, when you're in a small town like Arles, you know, if you do something, everybody knows about it the next day. It's kind of like Columbia. You smoke a cigarette, the next day they're all talking about your breath. So... It made the papers that this upset artist cut off his own ear. And somebody asked me just yesterday, was it because Gauguin left? Like, that's what caused it. Like, there had to be a cause. There had to be, you know, something that made him do that. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know. How would I? He's got this life of experience. Disappointing his father, probably disappointing his mother. He Always felt bad that his brother had to support him. Little kids in the town threw rocks at him. Artists he knew mocked his work, laughed at his work. He wanted to change the world. People thought that was stupid. And then Gauguin leaves, and he's looking at him. Vincent's looking at himself in the mirror and thinking, God, I've just disappointed everybody I've ever known. And it is all my fault, and maybe I'm just worthless. He hurts himself. It's not good. He did do it. But here's something that's absolutely fascinating to me, is he cuts his own ear off, bandages it up, and what? Does what? He turns around and he keeps painting. He, you know, somebody, like if I had like cut off a limb or something, I might take a break. <laughs> you know, when people come over and say, Will, you got a knife sticking out the side of your head. Yeah, I'm just relaxed. Just, he doesn't. He doesn't take a break. He goes right back to painting and smoking. So the pipe is there. And he's looking at himself. And I've really tried to sort of decipher this. And sometimes you got to admit that, you know, you're just guessing a lot. But you're guessing within the context of, you know, like, I look at all your paintings. I've read all your letters. And I know your artist buddies. And I'm trying to guess. I know your dad. And this look on his face to me, look at one eye and then look at the other. They're off, they're kind of, are they not a little bit off kilter? Almost crossing? Like the eyes don't even make sense. Like, are you really looking, like if you're looking at yourself, it's weird. Because your eyes should be a little more straight. 
Shouldn't they? Am I getting this wrong? You all see what I'm seeing? It's not right. Something's wrong. And sure enough, his brother is, is um, saying, look, we're going to have to put you in a, you're going to have to be in a hospital for a while. And this is a painting in our exhibition. It's not a huge painting, but it's an absolutely beautiful painting. He continues to paint even while he's hospitalized. He's given paints, and I think Theo must have arranged that. It's not something that would have been automatically done, that he was stocked up all the time. And this is classic Van Gogh from the end of his life. Everything is bright. The sky is blue. The clouds are just fleeing across the sky. Meanwhile, he is locked up every night as a danger to himself and to others, let out during the day to paint. And isn't that just like life? You know, you can walk around showing somebody a really happy face and inside you're just dying. And like nobody really is getting it or understanding anything that it is you're trying to say. So he does one incredible painting after another. And can I have the next one? I just wanted to show you, this is a Monticelli that we also have in the show. And really, he's always not far from his mind. There's some you know, residue or trace of all the art that he's ever known, and he uses it. But he has really gone brighter and thicker than all the artists around him eventually. So um, I want to talk about one in particular so we can have the next one. And the reason I didn't borrow this, because I didn't want to, and um, yeah, that's a joke, because <laughs> you, you can't get it. That's, the, that's why that was funny. So um, I don't mind explaining jokes. So while he's in hospital, while he's in hospital, he paints this. And I just want to point out some things about it, because this is a painting unlike, I mean, Monet could not have painted this. Now, I'm not putting him down or, or Renoir or anything. They wouldn't have painted it. Most artists at the time would have thought this was nutty. And some did, and some said it, because the sky is just a roiling bunch of waves, and these stars in the night are, each one is a gigantic sun. Well, let me tell you something. Van Gogh loved fairy tales. And who is that Dutch fairy tale writer? Thank you. Hans Christian Andersen, who writes a story called The Night Watchman, and it's about a guy at night who watches the sky and sees the stars and always wanted to travel to these stars. Vincent not only read that, carried it around with him. So he had a fantastical image of stars to begin with. And he knows Impressionism, so there's the bright, thick color. And you see the black outlines everywhere of things. He knew Cezanne, and Cezanne really pioneered that use of that heavy black line. So, you know, he takes that and he mixes it in. And of course, it's a city view, and he's painted tons of those from the artists that he's known all his life. All of that is good. So what are we talking about? We're talking about something that artists do all the time. They reshuffle their influences. If you got all these different influences and you, you had one influence and you just copied it, if you just loved Monet and you copied Monet, what's going to be the problem? You're just going to look like Monet. But what if you like literature and Monet and Cezanne and I just love walking in the fields, I really truly love nature and I love trees and I'm passionate about stars. And you mix all of that together, something like this might come out. Shuffling stuff around is just what artists do. And Vincent saw that many times. He knew about it. And he does it. He does it because that's what artists do. OK? I'm going to say it wasn't genius. It was what artists do. But because he was who he was, wrapped tight, living at the time he lived in the late 19th century when all these things were happening and they were new, he was in the perfect position to change the history of art, and he did. And I think this was right here. It was changing right as he did it. Art could be about not just what you're looking at, but your sense of yourself. Like this work of art doesn't refer to the world. Okay, now this is heavy. It doesn't refer to the world so much as it's self-referential. He takes the arrow and points it a different direction. Whoa. It's huge. Self-referential. Next time you're at a cocktail party, you can just have your you know, cocktail in somebody's house and look at their work of art on the wall and say, hmm, not hardly self-referential, self is it? Walk off. It's very nice. 
Now this, the reason I'm showing you this, this is a print by Gustave Doré. Doré's in the show all over the place. Vincent loved Doré, and he loved his prints. And this is an image from the Divine Comedy, and all of you have read the Divine Comedy. And this is when they finally, Dante and Virgil, finally get to, the, to heaven, to the Paradiso. And paradise, I mean, the center is God. And these concentric rings are angels. Light is made out of angels. Oh, that's a beautiful thought. And that's what they look like. Now, give me the next slide. And his stars look just like that. I mean, bingo on the money. I mean, the relationship between the number of rings and the size of the center. Um, at the time that he painted Starry Night, he was actually copying a print of Doré at the same time. So did he have Doré on his mind? Most definitely he did. But what is it? Does, that, does it diminish Van Gogh if you know his sources? I think it makes him more interesting. It makes him a man, a person, who looked at the world around him, embraced the world around him, knew everything that he could know about the world around him, and was willing to shuffle it up, mix it up, based on what? How he felt. And he comes out with this just exquisite, extraordinary image. OK, let's have the next one. I think it's probably going to be our last one. So. I think that what Van Gogh bequeathed to all of us, certainly to the artists around him and to the next generation of artists that came after him, a whole new way of, approach, of approaching painting. Yes, you can look at the world. Yes, you can inc incorporate literature. Yes, you can incorporate all your influences. But your emotions are probably the biggest ingredient. They're probably the most important ingredient because it's what's going to really distinguish you from everybody else. Because even though we don't have any choice about anything, at least we have a unique body to experience the world in. There are things that happen, that happen only to you that don't happen to your brother. I got to go to the birthday party. You didn't. One is unhappy. One isn't. And life just keeps going like that until you're a bazillion experiences wrapped up in a body. And who knows what you're going to do next? But this is where I'm going to leave it. I don't think Van Gogh chose anything. I think he was a product of all of his life experiences. But if art has shown me anything over all these years, is that when artists make art, that's another experience for them and for you. And when you look at art, you get a new experience every time you look at it. And when you look at different art, you get more experiences and more and more and more. And so when people say, well, OK, well, what is life then? It's experience. Life's to be lived. The sum of your experiences is the life you have. And art is going to provide you millions of experiences. And that's what I have to say about Vincent. Thank you.